to apply Omniverse to all kinds of uh, digital factories and robotics and warehouses and things like that. And so that's, that's another. Uh, we're, we're also working uh, in Saudi Arabia to build supercomputers to simulate quantum computers and, and uh, uh, using our computers to be the controller and the error correction, quantum error correction, uh, requires an enormous amount of computation. And so, so we're doing a lot of great work there too. So a, a big partnership with Humane. They're off the charts, um, off the ground and off the charts at the same time. This is how we walk the talk in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in partnership with the U.S. Yesterday, the President and His Royal Highness announced the AI strategic framework and partnership. Today, we're going big with Elon and Jensen. So thank you for those opportunities. Now, they, they told me I have time for two last questions. So last night at the dinner, I got a number of questions because it seems that the schedule leaked and uh, everybody was giving me hints about the last two questions I'm going to do. So the first one was for you, Elon, and there's a big one for you, uh, Jensen, so prepare for that one. AI in space, is that possible? Uh, yes. If, if civilization continues, which it probably will, uh, then AI in space is inevitable. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I always have to, like, preface that, you know. We shouldn't take civilization for granted. We, yeah. we need to make sure to take care to ensure that civilization has an, an upward arc. I mean, any student of history knows that civilization does not always have an upward arc, and in fact, civilizations have life, life cycles. So hopefully we are in a strong upward arc. I think we are for now, um, but we don't want to take that for granted or be complacent. Um, but the, in order to, the way to think of AI in space is that in order to achieve any meaningful percentage of a Kardashev two scale civilization where you're using even a millionth, a millionth uh, of the sun's energy, you must have solar powered AI satellites in, in deep space. Um, so, so that once you realize, like, once you think in terms of a Kardashev two-scale civilization, which is what, what percentage of the sun's energy are you turning into useful work, um, then, you, then it becomes obvious that space is overwhelmingly what matters. Overwhelmingly. The, the sun only receives one, roughly one two billionth of, the earth only receives roughly uh, one two billionth of the sun's energy. So if you want to have something that is, say, a million times more energy than Earth could possibly produce, you must go into space. It's, and, and so, um, you know, this is where it's kind of handy to have a space company, I guess. Um, <laughs> sell the book, Easier to say. cool chips in space, um, too. Yes. Easier to cool chips in space. Yep. Yes, there's definitely no water in space, so you're going to have to do something yeah. uh, that doesn't involve water. <laughs> just um, hang out. <laughs> well, it's, it's you're just going to radiate. That's right. Um, <laughs> so my, my estimate is that actually that, that, that the cost of, of electricity, like, like the, the cost effectiveness of AI in space will be overwhelmingly better than AI on the ground. So far, lo long before you uh, exhaust potential energy sources on, on Earth long, long before, meaning like I think even perhaps in the four or five year time frame, the lowest cost way to do AI compute will be with solar powered AI satellites. So I'd say not more than five years from now. Wow. And just look at the supercomputers we're building together. Let's say each one of the racks is two tons. Out of that two tons, 1.95 of it is probably for cooling. Right. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. imagine how tiny that little supercomputer is, right? Each one of these GB300 racks and, will and, just be a little tiny thing. And, and just electricity generation is, is already becoming a challenge. Um, so if, if, you, if you start doing any kind of scaling for both electricity generation and cooling, um, you realize, okay, space is incredibly compelling. Um, so, like, let's say you wanted to do uh, I don't know, two or three hundred gigawatts per year um, of, of uh, AI compute. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult to do that on Earth. Uh, the, so the, the uh, U.S. average electricity usage, uh, last time I checked, was around 460 gigawatts per year average usage. Um, 
So, so something like, say, uh, you know, th at three, 300, if you're doing 300 gigawatts a year, that would be like two-thirds of U.S. electricity production per year. Yeah. There's no way you're building power plants at that level. Um, and then if you take it up to, say, a terawatt per year, impossible. Yeah. Like, you have to do that in space. There, there, just is, there, there just is no way to do a terawatt uh, per year on Earth. Um, and, uh, and, and in space, you've, you've got continuous solar. Um, you've got, uh, you, don't, you actually don't need batteries because it's always sunny in space. That's right, exactly. Um, and, um, and, and the solar panels actually become cheaper because you don't need glass or framing. Um, and the cooling is just radiative. So that's, that's why I think... That's the dream. Yes. That's the dream. So, Jensen, everybody last night was asking me, and I'm mindful it's uh, earnings uh, call for you today. Mm. So I'm going to say this delicately. Everybody has been asking me to ask you, are we going to have an AI bubble? <laughs> that's the last question. All right, let's... No. <laughs> All right, let me, see, well, let me just tell you what we see. Okay, so... So I, I think it's really important when you look at what's happening around the world and go back to first principles of what's happening in computer science and computing. There are three things that are, that's happening. The first thing is that we all know that Moore's Law has run its course and the ability that the amount of demand for computing versus the amount of computation we can get out of general purpose computing is really challenging. And so the world's been moving to accelerated computing for some time. We've been pushing this now for some over 20 years. Let me give you one statistic. I was just at supercomputing. Six years ago, uh, CPUs were 90% of the world's supercomputers, top 500 supercomputers. Six years ago. This year, less than 15%. Went from 90% to 10%. And meanwhile, accelerated computing went from the other way, 10% to now 90%. Okay, so you're seeing that inflection point, the transition in high-performance computing from general-purpose computing to accelerated computing. Well, one of, the, one of the most data intensive, one of the most intensive computation things that the world does in cloud is data processing. Several hundred billion dollars of computation is done on just raw data processing. It has nothing to do with AI. Just SQL processing, data frames, you know, everybody's names, address, their, their sex, their, their age, where they live, you know, how much money they make. All of that sits into a data frame. And that data frame drives the world today, whether it's in banking or you know, whether it's in credit cards or, of course, e-commerce and uh, everything from ad recommendation. And everything is driven off of that data frame. That data frame costs hundreds of billions of dollars to go compute. And so that's the number one thing, end of Moore's Law. The second thing is generative AI. What the, the, the most important application of the last 15 years is called Rexis, recommender systems. How do we know what information to recommend to us uh, in a social feed? How do you know what ad to recommend to somebody, uh, what book to recommend, what movie to recommend? The world, is, the internet is so gigantic without a recommender system that a little tiny phone of us will have no chance of ever seeing the right information. That Rexis is the engine of the internet today. That's going generative AI. It used to be running on CPUs, now it runs on GPUs. Which then says the third thing, when if you just look at those two applications, many of the internet companies can build an enormous number of GPU supercomputers just doing that. Of course, then it creates this, the third opportunity on top of it, which is agentic AI. This is Grok, and this is OpenAI, this is Anthropic, you know, this is Gemini. Agentic AI sits on top of that. But don't, you know, don't forget to think about what is happening above, underneath, what everybody sees as AI today, there's a whole movement of computing from general purpose computing to accelerated computing. And that, if you just, if you take that into consideration, you'll come to the conclusion that in fact, what is left over to fuel that revolutionary agentic AI is not only substantially less than you thought and all of it justified. Well, I was just informed by the team that my boss and your bosses is gonna talk next the Honorable President and His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, and hence we ran out of time. But in essence, this is ours.